This is Reset and Renew with the Crew. My name is Jennifer Bailey, and I am the author behind Sing to Kids. My session today is Digging Deep, How to Grow an Activity into Long-Term Learning. Our session goals are learn how to include new activities into your lessons, learn how to spiral instruction with new repertoire, and learn how to extend the learning to reinforce musical skills and concepts. So I wanna start with a question today, and that is, what is the best part of attending workshops or conferences? For me, one of the things I love is connecting with music colleagues near and far and sharing ideas and making music together. Second, relevant professional development. As a music teacher, it is a challenge at times to find PD that is content specific. I love attending PD that is really focused on music, music education, and more specifically, elementary music. And lastly, I loved being inspired with new ideas, songs, chants, or activities that I can take back into my classroom and use with my students and make my own and connect to what we are learning in the music room. So I wanna begin with a scenario. You're attending a session, not unlike this one today, and you fall in love with an activity that's presented. What do you do? Do you go back on Monday and teach it to your kids right away? Do you file that activity away in your lesson plans for a rainy day and maybe even forget about it? Or do you find a meaningful way to connect the new activity into what you are already teaching? My hope is you answered C, but if you didn't, my hope is that by the end of this session, that will be your answer because I'm gonna be walking you through the steps of how to take a really fun, engaging activity that is presented to you in a workshop or conference and then make it your own so that it connects to your students and what they need in terms of uh, curriculum uh, goals. And I'm going to start by sharing a story that happened to me early on in my career. I had a good friend and colleague who went to a workshop and came back to our department meeting, excuse me, department meeting and shared this adorable activity using Edvard Griegs in the Hall of the Mountain King. And I think we all know the song, right? He am bum 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 And the activity that was presented to her was a very simple hand jive. It started with four claps of the hand then four fist taps, so you make two fists and you tap your right fist on top of your left fist two times and then switch and left on top of right two times. Then you take your hands and you scissor them across, right over left twice and then left over right twice. And to, then you take those thumbs like you're going hitchhiking, which we would never do in this day and age. And you take the two right thumbs, or excuse me, your right thumb and throw it back twice. And then your left thumb and throw it back twice. And then you repeat this hand jive throughout the entire song. Well, I have to tell you, when my friend shared this in our department meeting, I instantly fell in love with this activity. I thought it was fun, it was magical, and I knew my students were going to love it. And I wanted to teach it to my kids right away. Now I'm going to tell you, if you want to see an example of this activity in, uh, uh, in real life, I do have a video of it on my YouTube page. So if you go to YouTube and search Sing to Kids, and then look for In the Hall of the Mountain King. You can actually search that on the tab. You'll find it right there. So you'll see In the Hall of the Mountain King hand jive, and you can see me doing this. You'll notice I'm using a puppet, a wizard puppet. When this was presented to me, my friend used a witch puppet. 
Uh, those are no longer being made by folk manis. You have to buy them on Etsy and they're very expensive, but the uh, wizard puppet serves its purpose. And I will tell you that my uh, students would love this regardless if I used a puppet or not. It is magic no matter what. And so you don't have to use a puppet to present this activity. I do uh, because I love puppets to, to engage my students. Uh, so that's why that's there. So as I was saying, I instantly fell in love with this activity and I wanted to run back and teach to my kids the next day. But because I'm a thoughtful educator, I want, wanted to stop and think because cute activities without any underlying reason for teaching them really isn't good instruction. And so I wanted to be really thoughtful and purposeful about how I was going to teach this to my students and what else we could pull from this music uh, that would connect to our curricular goals. So I stop and reflected, where are my students right now in their music learning? How does the song support their learning? And how can I connect it meaningfully to support those musical skills or concepts? And by asking myself those questions, it gave me a moment to pause and really be purposeful about what I was going to teach from this simple little hand drive using In the Hall of the Mountain King. As always, my goal is to make curricular connections. So I want to be intentional about where are my students in their tonal development or melodic development? Where are they in their rhythmical development? What are my goals for this grade level? Do you curriculum map? Do you have an outline of what you're going to teach for each grade level that year? And then are there other ways to connect uh, meaningfully to this music? Can I explore form or harmony? Can I explore dynamics or tempo, timbre, composition, improvisation, etc.? So every choice I make about what I'm doing with my students is always through the lens of how can I connect this to their curriculum and make sure that what we're doing is purposeful and meaningful and going to grow them in their musicianship uh, with me? One thing that I find very helpful is just to do a quick analysis. So when I have a new song or activity or chant that I want to teach, I want to just quickly outline what are the things that I could connect to uh, with the song chant or activity. And uh, I'm going to walk you through this process, but if you would like a copy of this particular form, it is in my handout and you can print the blank copy to use for your own uh, analysis, but you could also see that I've put the, uh, the copy that I've done uh, as well so that you can see what it looks like when I do it for myself. So what am I going to do? I'm going to look at where are my students currently? How does this song match to my curricular goals? And what skills or concepts can I connect? So the first thing I do is I'm going to list everything that I'm working on currently with my students across tonal, rhythmic, harmony, form, and other. And you'll see at the top, I've named this activity. So it's in the Hall of the Mountain King, and I've made a conscious choice to target second grade with this activity. So you'll see tonally I've listed, oh, I could, uh, I'm working on major and minor concepts with my students, and we're learning about how melodies move by step, skip, and leap, and they have a resting tone. Rhythmically, we are uh, working on duple and triple meter and reading, or excuse me, audiating and chanting rhythm patterns, as well as reading half note, quarter note, and eighth note patterns with rest. Harmony, we are doing tonic and dominant chord root harmony form. We are learning about ABA form as well as theme. And then in the other column, we're reinforcing dynamics and tempo. You can see here I've listed the rhythmic things because I'm going to specifically hone in on rhythm with my students. 
Next, I'm going to list all the things I know about that piece that I want to use beyond just the fun activity. So what does the song activity contain? Well, tonally, I know it's a minor melody, that it moves by step skip and begins and ends on the resting tone. Rhythmically, I know that it's a duple meter song, and I know that there are some rhythms in there that we might be able to pull out and have my students practice reading. Harmony, I'm not going to worry about because it's more complex than we're uh, ready for in second grade. Form, I could explore theme with students and how a repeating uh, theme can be used in a composition. And then other, I could explore dynamics, tempo, timbre, and coda. So I'm just going to list everything there that I could teach with my students. You'll see at the bottom, I've also listed other notes. I could introduce the composer. I could make connections to popular music. If you're aware, In the Hall of the Mountain King is used in one of the troll movies, and my students almost instantaneously recognize the melody because of their uh, exposure to the trolls uh, movie. Once I've done that work, now it's time to make a decision. I need to decide what is going to be most beneficial for my students. What is going to give me the best bang for my buck? And those are the skills or concepts that I'm going to choose to connect. So you can see that I've chosen to connect rhythmic skills. We're going to explore uh, form there and then dynamics and tempo. You may make different decisions based on where your students are at or the students that are in front of you at this moment. You might choice, choose to do this with a different grade level. That is the beauty about this analysis is that you can make instructional matches for the students that work best for you. So now that I've done that analysis, I have to get into the day-to-day -day lesson planning. Now that I know what I can teach from this really cute activity, how do I plan it into my lessons? Well, day one, I'm going to teach that hand jive, and I'm going to do it with the piece. Do I do it as the first uh, experience into this lesson? No. I'm going to teach the hand jive explicitly. Musicians, we're going to start with four hand claps. Repeat after me. Clap, 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 clap have your students say and do. Then I'm gonna take my fist and tap the right fist on top of the left fist. Tap, 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 musicians say and do. So I'm going to explicitly teach each part of the hand jive. And then we're gonna go back and say and do the hand jive from beginning to end, speaking and saying while we do it. <clears throat> Once they can do that, we'll put it with the music and perform the hand jive to the music. After we've done that, I'm going to ask my students, what did they notice about that hand jive? Answers might include, it repeated, it got faster. Those questions are going to be springboards to the content that we're going to be exploring later. So having our students not just do the activity, but also talk about what did they notice is going to be so helpful when we get to the content that we're going to layer into the lesson plan. Day two is going to be reviewing what we learned on day one and adding a bit more to the lesson. We're going to start by repeating that hand jive again. And then I'm going to ask my students, did you ever get bored with that hand jive? Why? Why not? Have them speak back to you. Why did they enjoy it? Why was it engaging? Why was it fun? And then I'm going to ask them to make a prediction about how many times the theme is performed. And we're going to listen to the music again, and we're going to count. Now, the images on the screen right now are, are from a resource that I developed for In the Hall of the Mountain King. And one of my favorite things, you'll see the little dragon with the 18 on it. We have a, a little tally with the dragons that count how many times they hear the music performed or the theme performed. So if that's something that might be of interest to you, you can find that in my TPT store. Listen to the song again, count. What does the composer do to keep that theme interesting? Answers might include, hey, they changed the instruments, or it got faster, and we're going to connect that to the word tempo, or, oh, it got louder, connect it to the word dynamics. All of these answers, again, are a springboard for musical discussions or content that we're going to be exploring in our next lesson. Day three. 
We're going to review what we learned on days one and two and continue to layer more content. Last time we learned that the composer repeated the theme 18 times and you never got bored with it. Why? What did the composer use to keep it interesting? Remember to review those big terms, dynamics and tempo, and have students use that when they're speaking back to you, their opinion or their noticings about the music. Today, we're gonna look at the theme and see how the composer wrote it rhythmically. Can you audiate the rhythm patterns? Can you read the rhythm patterns? Are there any notes that you don't know? Is it a complicated theme rhythmically? Why? Why not? And I'm going to have my students actually read each rhythm pattern. So whether you use ta and titi or du and dute, have your students read each rhythm. Dute, 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 do. Dute, do, dute, do. Dute, 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 dute. Dute, dute, do. And once they've read each pattern in isolation, have them go back and read the entire theme rhythmically from beginning to end using the solfege. You'll notice there are other symbols on the page like the repeat sign, the measure signs, and the time signature. If students ask about those things, I name them, but I don't go into a deep theoretical discussion about what they are. So if a student asks, what is that thing at the end of the music? That's a repeat sign. It tells us that we're going to go back and repeat the entire uh, rhythm of the theme. What are those lines in between the each rhythm pattern? Oh, those are called measure lines. They just help us organize each rhythm into four beats. What is that four for? That's a meter signature. It tells us that we're in duple meter. So those are how I explain those things when students ask those questions, but I don't go into a deep dive about those because we're not ready for that right now. All right, day four, review what we learned on days two and three, and then reinforce or assess content. So last, last time, excuse me, we practiced reading the rhythms of the theme. Let's practice it again. Let's practice reading those rhythms. We know that the composer repeated the theme 18 times and that you never got bored with it because of his use of dynamics and tempo. Let's look at some of those musical terms and symbols for tempo and dynamics. In second grade, my students are aware that tempo is how fast or slow the music is performed and dynamics is how, or excuse me, how loud or soft the music is performed. They know that terminology. What they may not know is that piano means to perform soft and forte means to perform loud or pianissimo is really soft and fortissimo is really loud. So this is where I may begin to introduce those Italian terms that the composer uses in the music. So this is how the composer communicates how they want that music performed. Introduce those terms, practicing them with the students, have the students use those terms when they're describing the music to you. And then lastly, close with that hand dive again. Why? Because they love it. It's fun, it's engaging. And that was what uh, accessed all of this wonderful, deep musical content and conversation you could have about the piece. So why not use that to our advantage and let them enjoy it and do it again? So I've done four days on In the Hall of the Mountain King. What's next? Well, now that I've taught the desired content from the piece, I'm going to look at what my students need next. Is there anything I could assess? Could I assess their knowledge or understanding of tempo and dynamics? Sure. Could I assess their ability to read those rhythm patterns? Absolutely. What did my students do really well? Where did my students struggle? Did they struggle with those Italian terms? Did they struggle identifying tempo and dynamics in the music? Did they struggle reading rhythmically? Is there anything that I previewed but really need to teach? Maybe I've not taught tempo and dynamics before, but I've introduced it and that's the springboard to then teach it and really um, play with it and, and apply it in other pieces of music. Is there anything that crashed and burned and I just need to go back and reteach it? And then what needs to be reinforced? Because we know we don't teach things one and done. Uh, we are constantly um, 
spiraling our content with our students so that they can learn it at a deeper and deeper level. So is there anything they need to go back and reinforce? I have two images on the screen for you. Both are resources in my store that I use as natural springboards from this lesson. The first is uh, a companion resource to the storybook, children's storybook, Listen to the Rain. That book is written by uh, Bill Martin Jr. and John Archambault. I'm not sure that it's in print anymore, but I'm sure you could find it in your school library or the children's section of your local library. It is a lovely descriptive book about different kinds of rain, and it is literally a study of dynamics without ever talking about dynamics specifically. So I use that book and read it to my students and we identify that different kinds of rain have different kinds of dynamics. And then this companion resource really explores how you can connect those different kinds of rain to different kinds of dynamic levels. And um, you can have students identify those things. You can actually even have your students create a rainstorm for you and explore dynamics uh, by making those different sounds in uh, the rainstorm. The second uh, resource I have here is a, a nursery rhyme called one, two, three, four. So if my students really did well with reading rhythmically, I have to make a decision. Are they ready for new content or do I wanna dig deeper in the content that they just uh, uh, did for me? And this is one that I love to use when I wanna dig deeper instead of moving forward. The chant goes like this, one, two, three, four, I spy Eleanor sitting on the kitchen floor eating lots of candy. It's a great little chant to do around Halloween if you celebrate Halloween, but if not, you can just do it without any kind of Halloween connotation there. Uh, what I love about this is there are so many opportunities for you to have students uh, really go deeper in their understanding of rhythmic content. So my students can decode rhythms, so I can have patterns like ba, 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 and they have to decode that. Perhaps they say do, 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 de, do, or ta, ta, ti, ti, ta. There are also images of candy like gum and sucker and candy apple and candy corn, and they can take each one of those pieces of candy and arrange them into different uh, rhythm patterns so they can use those to manipulate and move around uh, and create their own rhythm patterns. They can use the candy to decode so they could have a rhythm that said gum, gum, sucker, gum, and they could decode that into do, 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 de, do. They can create their own rhythm patterns. They love to make rhythm trains. It's a great resource to dig deeper in your rhythmic content instead of moving forward in your rhythmic content. It's a great activity to use on a music center day where students can have autonomy over the way they're going to work rhythmically and learn as well. So those are all decisions I have to make based on one little fun activity I learned 20 plus years ago from a colleague. Uh, how do I take this fun, engaging thing and really grow it into deep, meaningful instruction? And then where do I go with that once my students have experienced it? I hope that this process has been helpful for you. Please look at my handout. It has my notes from the session as well as that um, analysis form for you to use for your own reflection. And uh, Again, my name is Jennifer Bailey. I'm the author behind Sing to Kids. I hope you enjoyed today's session. If you find uh, my style of presentation helpful, please know I do have a blog at www.singtokids.com where I love to share uh, information about elementary music and blog about things that are important to us as elementary music educators. So I invite you to come join us on the blog as well. And thank you so much for attending today's session. I hope you have a wonderful day.